Hi there, everyone. Welcome to this session. I'll share my screen so you can read along. Um, today's open discussion is based on lessons 246 to 252 of A Course in Miracles. Um, we will look at the seven lessons of the past week. Um, they form the starting point for our conversation. Let's first center our minds. Allow your breath to settle in a comfortable pattern. Gently inhaling and gently exhaling. Gently and quietly, in and out. in your own comfortable pace. Whenever a stray thought enters your mind, do not pay attention to it, but allow it to move past. Just watch it move away, like you would watch a cloud in the sky move past without clinging to it. Focus on the empty, receptive expanse that is your mind. Peace to our mind. Let all our thoughts be still. Now let's focus on our presence together here in this space. We've come here in the name of willingness of gentleness and of peace. We've gathered here in the name of love and light. We embrace and enjoy this moment of stillness together in the name of Jesus, who has promised that when two or more are gathered in his name, he will be there with them. And so we trust that he is here with us. The following prayer is from lesson 245. Your peace surrounds, surrounds me, Father. Where I go, your peace goes there with me. It sheds its light on everyone I meet. I bring it to the desolate and lonely and afraid. I give your peace to those who suffer pain or grieve for loss or think they are bereft of hope and happiness. Send them to me, my Father. Let me bring your peace with me. For I would save you, son, as is your will, that I may come to recognize myself. And so we go in peace. To all the world we give the message that we have received. And thus we come to hear the voice for God, who speaks to us as we relate his word. Whose love we recognize because we share the word that he has given unto us. Amen. All right, everyone. Is there anything that anyone would like to share ahead of time before we look at the lessons? Or is there one lesson in particular that you, oh, okay, go ahead, Keith. I have a question. Go ahead. As the, as the newbie, I was wondering if I could get a, historical, um, how the group started, when it started? Have you all been here from the start? Some of us have, but not all. It sort of, it sort of shifts over time. Um, does anyone want to elaborate a bit on it? We started in January. Oh, okay. Just and sure. The first session, um, uh, Tam Morgan, the, the president of the foundation was present and she sort of introduced it. Uh, for all of us. And then the, the next session, we did the first 14 lessons. Well, did, I mean, it, they formed a starting point. I don't think we, we covered them all. And since then, we've been doing seven lessons uh, each week. Sometimes there, there'll be like three or four people. Sometimes there'll be eight or 10. It, it differs. Okay. But I think that um, of the people who, who are here now, Peter, Ardith, and myself, we've been from the, here from the beginning, right? 
I think I came, I, I came in like April or May. Oh, okay. Derek, oh, Derek invited me. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And, and Derek and Manu have been here from the start, but Manu is absent now because of his holidays, but he's actually been here almost all, all times. And Derek had to, um, his, his work schedule changed. So he's not able to, to join us for the time being. I hope he, ho he hopes it will, it will change again and then he'll be able to come. So uh, any other questions or is that, is that what you were looking yeah. for? I would like okay. to look for it. Thank you. Yeah. It's part of the, uh, uh, the initiative that the Foundation for Inner Peace um, decided to have a Facebook group, which is Let's Discuss A Course in Miracles. And that got underway a little over two years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And then part of that um, initiative, uh, the weekly meditation started this past January and these workbook discussions on Zoom, both on Zoom. So it's sort of like an outreach to discuss the Course in Miracles. Um, as per the injunction that Jesus gave, I don't know if you're aware of that, to, to publish, distribute, and discuss A Course in Miracles. That was, that was the, the assignment that the foundation received. So this is part of the third uh, element in that assignment. All right, I'll um, share my screen and then we can start talking about the first lesson, which is 246. Um, Sharon, would you like to read? Okay, um, lesson 246. To love my father is to love his son. Let me not think that I can find the way to God if I have hatred in my heart, let me not try to hurt God's son and think that I can know his father or myself. Let me not fail to recognize myself and still believe that my awareness can contain my father or my mind, conceive of all the love my father has for me and all the love which I return to him. I will accept the way you choose for me to come to you, my father, for in that will I succeed, because it is your will. And I would recognize that what you, you will is what I will as well, and only that. And so I choose to love your son. Amen. Does anyone have anything to share about that lesson? Hi, Katie. Yeah. Um, the first line, if I have hatred in my heart, I suppose hatred stands for many, many types of emotions or feelings or intentions that we could have that block the way to God. Uh, in the second paragraph, I will accept the way you choose for me to come to you, my father, mm -hmm. for in that will I succeed because it is your will. Uh, for me, I, I just seems like I don't really get a lot of guidance. So I just, uh, I have to assume that the way things are going is, is what God's intention is. What's, what makes you doubt that? Well, just because I really don't get clear guidance when I, when I, when I have to make a decision and I uh, try to get guidance from the Holy Spirit, it just seems to be the decision's up to me. And I try to choose what I think is right. Mm -hmm. okay. Years ago, I used to look for omens and they did seem to occur periodically, like uh, a bird appearing suddenly uh, or something good happening after I make a decision that had no relationship to it. But I sort of got away from that even and just, uh, I, I practiced the course, but I just don't get 
if I don't hear a voice that gives me guidance. So hmm. I just I just have to assume that the way the path I'm on is the right path. And have trust. I have to have trust in that. Keith? I feel exactly the same way, Andrew. But then I I ask you and I ask myself the same question. If there's a, a right mind or wrong mind. Which mind just told you that you do not get guidance? <laughs> yeah, it seems that it always I hear the ego's voice. You know, when I when I feel God's presence, it, it's an inner peace, but not a voice. The ego always speaks in words. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't ever hear a voice, but I, I definitely feel like I get pictures, you know, like, like that situation. I think I talked about when my husband was snoring so bad and he wasn't willing to do any of the, um, the things or use any of the devices. There was a thing with your nose. There was different things that you could try. And he was like, no, I can't do that. And I, I really felt well, I think I told you guys that. And I asked, I went inside and asked, what can I do? <laughs> to, how can I see this differently? And I immediately saw little fairy lights all over the inside of our Airstream trailer. And it was like, oh, go there when he's snoring. Uh -huh. And it was like such a clear answer, but there was no voice that told me anything. But I, I just felt like that's, that's it. That's the answer. And I did it and I only had to do it like twice and he stopped snoring. I know, I know. So it's not, for me, it's not a voice, but I, I do get, I do get direction when I ask. Mm -hmm. Ardith, do you wanna share? Oh, yeah, sorry. No. Um, I, was thinking, I was just thinking that Helen didn't hear a direct voice if I'm correct in that. You're correct. So if she didn't, uh, I wouldn't be concerned that you don't. I mean, if you do, that will be wonderful. But most of us uh, find we get this, uh, we get help and answered in so many different ways. They mention license plates and, and radio songs and some casual remarks, about casual in quotes, that someone will make. Um, it really is a question, I think, of us getting tuned into how God does through the Holy Spirit reach us because it is individualized. And I think more that we become less expecting a booming voice to come to us and just become more quiet when we ask and then find out what's going on. What am I feeling? What am I seeing? What's happening? I have a feeling you'll find that you're going to get a lot more answers than you ever thought possible. It's just my little take on it, but that's my experience. Thank you. Thank you. Guess I'll what I was in. getting at I'll earlier go. was um, if I was an ego, I would tell Andrew he's not here in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so should should we trust that? Well, I suppose it's a, it's it's not a crime to to doubt. To, to not be sure that's that's not it's not a sin and it's um and double checking is always good yeah so um and sometimes the ego can be really sweet <laughs> so you, <laughs> you, it sort of trips you up um so i i fully understand the question i fully understand it the, the way that i don't hear a voice either what i do i i, I engage in intuitive writing every morning and i just sit at my keyboard and i wait till i to like get a message or an under, usually I get an understanding. I get an understanding and I find words for that understanding. Um, but it, ne it needs a specific question. It's rare are the cases that I will just get an understanding without a question. So I have to ask a question and the question has to start with a W word like what um, or, or or, or, or with an H, how, how, but not with the verbs like yes or no. It, it will have to be an open question, but very specific. Or sometimes I will describe a situation 
and I will just, you know, I'll, I'll write my, my question in uh, cursive, in italics, and I will just uh, end the description of the situation, and I'll end with help, or I end with, uh, please uh, give your insights if you think that will be helpful at this time. And then I sit quietly, and I just wait. And at first, it's like I feel like I'm jumping into a deep pool because I have no clue what's going to come. And then all of a sudden, I, I, I get some inkling and I start typing. And, um, and then I'm off. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just going, you know, it, sometimes it's a paragraph. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's just two lines. Um, and then usually I have a, a question because of that. And then before I know it, I have a whole page. Um, yeah, so it's sort of like a dialogue. Um, but it's not a voice. So it's not, even though it's it's a clear understanding. And sometimes I read back what I've written and I get a clear indication that's the wrong word. I don't hear a voice, but I hear like, find another word because that's not the right word. And then I have to change it and it feels right when I change it or it still doesn't feel right and I have to keep looking. Um, yeah, go ahead, Peter. And then Ardith again. So um, I have heard a voice twice in my life. Twice, it was very clear. Uh, it was unexpected and unasked for. It just came through and it was words. But other than that, and I've been seeking that ever since, but other than that, it's that's the exception, not the rule. And for me, it's often in, in the form of like an intuitive feeling. Yeah. And that is like when I'm faced with a challenge, the very, very first feeling that I get about that challenge turns out to be positive, reassuring, whatever. And that's, that's, I feel like that's the Holy Spirit conveying to me, it's going to be okay. Um, you don't, you don't have to worry. The problem is I kind of ignore that. And then I start thinking and, and that's the ego. And I start thinking about what could go wrong how it's already gone wrong, how, how you know, screwed I am in this situation, and I lose that feeling of peace. So it's that initial, there's the initial hit, and then if I can remember that and stick, and stick with that, I'm fine, and uh, you know, I'll keep my ego out of it. Other than that, um, you know, for a long time, I have been agonizing over why, why is God not talking to me? Why am I not getting specific direction on this? And the only thing I can say now is uh, it's probably because I'm more on the right track than the wrong track in general. And the other thing is, you know, I don't think God, the Holy Spirit will, will infringe on my free will, which includes the free will to make mistakes so I can learn from those mistakes. You know, and um, and the last thing I'll say is I think God thinks I'm a lot more capable than I do. And so so learning to trust myself, to trust my, you know, my my judgment, my instincts, whatever. So I think it's all of that. Um, I have often wanted God to micromanage my life and and I got the distinct feeling God's not interested in that. Thanks. Ardith? Yeah, first of all, I want to say everything that you and Peter said, yay, on all of that. Um, the other thing, I have heard myself occasionally, yes, a voice, but I really recognize it as my own voice, but I can tell by the tone and by the, the uh, placement of it that it was in direct answer to something. It was in two crises, I will say, and another time just general reassurance. But I don't look for that because um, I, it seems to come now as I'm trusting more and more. It comes almost automatically. Um, when I do a combination, I guess, of what uh, Johanna said and Peter was talking about. The other thing I'd like to say is that, and I'm not promoting any particular teacher at all, but uh, I would advise to go on to YouTube and um, place David Hoffmeister's name in there. He has tons and tons and tons of program, uh, programs, of uh, videos about how, how to hear the Holy Spirit, how to talk to the Holy Spirit, and he, um, his, he, he will say that he speaks with Jesus 
I will let you to discover exactly how that happens, but he's got such an open uh, moment-to-moment living by the Holy Spirit way that if anybody wanted to get some instructions as to possibly how to do that, or at least some helps, I think he might be a good one to turn to. So anyway, that's my bit. Thank you. Thank you, Artis. Thank you, Peter. Um, one, one, more, one more thing. Oh, oh Peter just and then quick. Keith. Yeah, just, one, just very quick. Sometimes I notice I have to listen to the advice I'm giving to other people because that's the message I need to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's it. Keith, go ahead. So I need people to, to disagree with me if they do because I'm really stuck on this. Um, we mentioned doubt is okay, but I don't foresee the Holy Spirit telling me doubt's okay um, or doubt's mm-hmm. from me. Um, doubt is something that I help you with or, or that I put in you. Um, so to me, this, this me not hearing the Holy Spirit is something that ego would tell me. Uh, rather than it be a fact. I mean Yeah, I I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. But if if the thought comes up, I'm not hearing it, or if the thought comes up, is this is this correct? A doubtful thought. Then rather than ignoring it and pr- repressing it, um what they call like a spiritual bypass, I must be hearing it. So you know that must be the case. And ignoring my experience is not going to, going to help. So I would need to offer up that doubt. And I would need to offer up not knowing. And if I, if I judge it, if I judge myself for not knowing and for doubting, you know, I'll, I'll get stuck. So that, that was what I meant to say. I, I, I don't know if that addresses what you were saying. Well, I, I'm... I'm saying that um, that what I was I understood um, that I often believe that um, I'm not being spoken to, or the or Holy Spirit's not in my life. But those those words don't sound like something that would come from Jesus. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you offer it up. So you say. Sweet Jesus or Holy Spirit, here I am again, feeling like I'm being left on in in the in the lurch on the lurch. How do you say it? Um, uh, in the lurch. In the lurch, left in the lurch. Um, yep. I'm all by myself. Please help. And then trust that help is going to come. I guess another way to it is I'm doubting my doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, a good one. that's again how 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 the ego will spin it huh mm-hmm. yeah Artif? no I, was, <laughs> I keep forgetting that nine um yeah no i think the big the big deal is uh really just trusting on a moment-to-moment basis and realizing that the holy spirit uh, is the voice for god for us and knows where we each are because it's within us and the whole idea is our happiness and our joy. Yeah. And so any time that we feel uh, a, a finger of accusation at us or feel I'm doubting, I'm doubting, I'm doubt, that's not the Holy Spirit. And mm-hmm. in saying, for instance, that the Holy Spirit um, doesn't approve of our doubt, that's not the question. It's it's just a fait accompli that it's going to happen. And the whole deal is to just keep going and uh, trust in the Course and trust in the Holy Spirit and in our, our own being to be willing to do this, to remove those blocks to the awareness of love's presence. That's our, our deal. We don't have to, anything else is just gives fuel to the fire for the ego. So just be happy and be, be trusting and you'll be carried. You really will. I promise you. My intent was to help Andrew because we were in the same boat Um, and sometimes I have you know I I need a decision in life and and I hear something and it's and it's seems right and I go on with my life I never 
give um, spirituality credit for that answer. And maybe that's a mistake. You know, maybe that was um, the Holy Spirit gave me that answer. It's never, a, I'm not talking about a direct question. Hey, Holy Spirit, do I need to do this or this? I'm just saying that I make a decision and it's, and it's good. And who am I to say it wasn't from the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it probably was. Because if, <laughs> if you feel good about it, it, it is, in one place in the course, it actually, Jesus actually says, how can you tell that the Holy Spirit, that you're listening to the Holy Spirit by the way you feel? Yeah. And so if a decision, like you were saying, Keith, if you make, if you take a decision and it feels good, that's your sign. Yeah. And so the, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you through that feeling. That's the way of seeing it. I found all your comments very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you for asking the question. Peter. Yeah, just one other thing I would say real quick is, you know, this for me is related to this question of God's will versus my will. What, what am I listening for? I'm listening for God's will. The Course says all true pleasure comes from doing God's will. And um, as a willful person and as a, you know, uh, a staunch advocate for ego autonomy, I find this idea of God's will, you know, is a little too much. So I say, what is God's way? Instead of God's will, God's way. And that is, that comes back to what we talked about last week, which was this question that actually comes from uh, conversations with God. What would love do now? Yeah. That's another way of saying, what would God do now? Which is another way of giving me direction in that moment. Okay, I have all these potential choices. I can, I can lash out. I could, I could hide out. I can um, attack. I can retreat. But what would, you know, what would love do? What would God do? What is God's way in this situation? And then just being willing. And I, I have to admit, I, I don't do this. I probably don't even do it as often as I could. But that's for me, that's kind of a way into this, you know, is to say, what's God's way? What's God's, what would, what would you have me do? You know, what, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? It's just in that, just for that one moment, being willing to ask instead of assuming that I know, you know, and, um, and the other is this whole idea of shared interests too. You know, when I see another person, I'm really seeing myself and the, qualification for becoming a teacher of God is that somehow, some way, I was willing to see somebody else's interests as my own. And, and so, and if heaven, the definition in the course of heaven is awareness of complete oneness and through unity, if in that moment I see somebody else's interests as my own, I'm joining. This is about joining. And so, so I, if I'm truly doing that from this place of really wanting to do that, then I am acting and I feel it would seem to me I'm acting in accordance with God's will. And that's, that would be God's direction in that moment. Thank you. Thank you. That's very, very profound, Peter. Uh, Sharon. Um, okay. Um, what did uh, you know, I hear people say things uh, and read in the course too, uh, God's plan or God's will and all that. And <clears throat> I don't think God has a plan. Uh, I, I don't think God has any will other than for us to be joyful. I, I, I don't see God as thinking about things and wanting us to do certain things. I, I just think God is a love that radiates out and I don't certainly don't understand how that could be but that's how I think it is and I think that the Holy Spirit is here to sort of like interpret all that for us because we don't know how to jump from I mean that is such a lofty idea for me that uh, I'm very grateful that there is explanations for all of that because my ego will jump in and take credit for everything there's been a couple of times in my life that as a kid that I, I can remember 
a thought coming into my mind when I was about eight years old and my mother called my sister, who was two years older than me, uh, and was not a happy child. She was born unhappy. I don't know why, but both my parents were always trying to make her happy. And I remember my mother saying, uh, oh, Sandra, come let me come let me show you something in this magazine. And Sandra went to her and she was showing her. And in, in my mind, I remember thinking, mother never does that with me. She never calls me to come see something. And there was a thought that came right behind it. And it was, that's because you don't need it. And later on in life, I remembered that. And I thought, oh, that was a really wise little thing for me to think. And then <laughs> much later, it was like, oh, that wasn't you. That was the Holy Spirit explaining <laughs> what was going on. You hear the so, voice. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't a voice, though. It was just a thought. It's because yeah. you don't need it. Yeah. You know, so anyway, I, I don't see God as having a plan. When people say, oh, well, it's God's will. God's will that that happened. Uh -uh. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Not in that way. I think the word will, is, it means something different for many different people. I mean, it's not, yeah. it doesn't yeah. mean the same for everybody. Yeah. Ardith, your hand is up. Yeah, I was just saying too. I just quickly uh, went into the um, the courses uh, online space and just put in in the search engine God's plan, and 104 results came up. So I really would say that anybody who, including myself, anybody who wants to get an idea what is meant by God's plan in the course, definitely do that because there's a lot of material there to go with. Yeah, that, well, that that would be a great thing to sort of like research. I would, I'll yep. do that. You can do it. <laughs> I, I, I suppose what Sharon was saying though is that he doesn't have a plan in terms of form. He has exactly. a, of course, exactly. of course, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's understand. Yeah, exactly. He has a plan in ter in terms of leading us home. That's his plan, mm -hmm. and spirit is part of that plan. Atonement is part of the plan. But when you get really right down to it, it's not even that because God doesn't even know we left. Because we didn't, you know, <laughs> I think we did. That's for our, it's for our benefit, actually, of course. And I just read one thing from the, the, the results that I pulled up in that search. And it's from chapter 14. And it says, the one, and I'm assuming it's talking about Holy Spirit there, the one who knows the plan of God, that God would have you follow, can teach you what it is. I, it, for me, I read into that certain elements of that individualized plan, um, maybe someone wants to talk about that part of it, or maybe not. Well, what I was going to say was, I agree, you know, God's will for us is perfect happiness. It says that in the course. The problem is, I don't know what makes me happy. I think I know what makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, so this is where I think God's got the Holy Spirit you know, helps because it's like, oh, I, you know, and it says, Again, I forget exactly where it says, you know, it, it, the gist of the the comment is, you know, nothing that I've ever sought has really brought me happiness, true happiness. It's always led to disappointment, disillusionment, whatever. So I think in terms of God's plan for me is perfect happiness, the Holy Spirit will show me how to get there. Because yep. right now, everything I think that's going to make me happy, you know, 99 out of 100 times, that hasn't been true happiness. Yeah. And there's a distinction, you know, and, I, and I, again, I keep saying this, but I wrote about this in my book, the distinction between satisfaction, relief, um, physical pleasure, or just fun and true happiness. You know, satisfaction is great, but it's fleeting, whereas true happiness is always there if we, if we want it. You know, relief Relief is great. There's nothing wrong with relief, but a lot of people confuse that with happiness. True happiness and relief are two different things. Yeah. Relief is in the moment, and but it's fleeting. Again, as soon as the moment changes, that feeling can go. True happiness is there no matter what's going on. And I think that's why true happiness comes from doing God's will, because God, you know, because because God is not fleeting. God does God's love for us does not change. Remember, we're here to remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, you know, and as those blocks are removed, that love is unchangeable because that's God. 
So in the moment when I feel relief or satisfaction or physical pleasure, again, there's nothing wrong with any of that, but that's not true happiness. That's not what the, not what the course is talking about. Anyway, I'm getting a little off track, but that's what I got. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No, so good points. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll pull up the, the lesson again. I will accept the way you choose for me to come to you, my father. So for in that will I succeed because it is your will. It is your will, the, I, the, the way I understand it, that I will come to the father. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to share about that lesson or shall we look at the next one? I find it interesting that it ends with, and so, and so I choose to love you, son. So sort of like the concluding statement for the whole lesson mm -hmm. is, I choose to, lo to love your son, which is everybody else and myself. At least that's how I read it. Okay. Um, Andrew, would you like to read the next lesson, please? Sure. Lesson 247. Without forgiveness, I will still be blind. Sin is the symbol of attack. Behold it anywhere, and I will suffer. For forgiveness is the only means whereby Christ's vision comes to me. Let me accept what his sight shows me as the simple truth, and I am healed completely. Brother, come and let me look on you. Your loveliness reflects my own. Your sinlessness is mine. You stand forgiven, and I stand with you. So would I look upon everyone today. My brothers are your sons. Your fatherhood created them and gave them all to me as part of you, and my own self as well. Today, I honor you through them, and thus I hope this day to recognize myself. Well, it stresses forgiveness, which really is the, the whole key, according to the Course, to uh, achieving awareness of love's presence. Uh, but it's hard. It's the, well, we talked about it before. The hardest one to forgive is, is our own self, mm -hmm. our own ego, apparently. But uh, it's a great lesson. Without forgiveness, mm -hmm. I will still be blind. Yeah, that keeps us, without forgiveness, we're still stuck. Does anyone like to share anything about that lesson? Only that it's, it's uh, very plain about forgiveness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, line three particularly, for forgiveness is the only, 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 only means whereby Christ's vision comes to me. So if we try any other path, good luck to us. Forgiveness is it. Yeah. It's the undoing. It's an in the yep. recognition that it's not real. Mm -hmm. And that holds for ourselves as well. It's not like situations mm -hmm. that, that we find hard to accept, but it's, you know, and, and that those situations aren't real, but what, what Andrew was saying, forgiving yourself for things that, mm -hmm. that, that you feel you're doing wrong or that you've done wrong, that's not real either. Mm -hmm. I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that sometimes, but <laughs> working on it. <laughs> I mean, this, the idea of sin, though, I think is a, it, it, it's really good to, to focus on it. Not too long, but to focus on the understanding, especially in the Judeo-Christian tradition, because yeah. uh, it has such a different meaning from that in the Course. And it, this, as being a symbol of attack, boy, that sure takes us off the hook as as the one way of putting it, um, once we realize that all we do is make mistakes and mistakes can be corrected, um, yes. then it becomes very plain to us that we've kind of bought the wrong story. And uh, the, that's what this whole course is. It's a way for us to read a new story, a new way. A new dream, yeah. 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 I, I just scrolled a bit further down to get to the, to the essay, What is Sin? 
which is the, the essay that comes comes after lesson 250. Would it be a good idea to read that now? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, who would like to take it? I'll take it. All right. What is sin? Sin is insanity. It is the means by which the mind is driven mad and seeks to let illusions take the place of truth. And being mad, it sees illusions where truth should be and where it really is. Sin gave the body eyes for what is there the sinless would behold. What need have they of sights or sounds or touch? What would they hear or reach to grasp? What would they sense at all? To sense is not to know. And truth can be but filled with knowledge and with nothing else. That, that raises a lot of questions for me. Uh, what is there? Uh, what, what need have they of sight or sounds or touch? The sinless. It, it, it makes me wonder what we're in for when we finally <laughs> finally achieve our goal. You know, because uh, everything we know, we know through the senses. But then we don't have just physical senses. We have we've got mental senses and we've got spiritual senses. So to me, it's sort of like part of the ladder, right? <laughs> yes. Well, we wouldn't need sight. Or we wouldn't need sounds. That, that, it's that all in can, the mind. Yeah, that can be a little confusing. Yeah. Anyway, I'll continue. No, no, you, you, you're absolutely right to raise it. Go ahead. The body is the instrument the mind made in its effects to deceive itself. The sorry, efforts. It, oh. Sorry, in, that was my, it, yeah. In its efforts to deceive itself. Its purpose is to strive. It can the goal of striving change. And now the body serves a different aim for striving. What it seeks for now is chosen by the aim and mind has taken as a replacement for the goal of self-deception. Truth can be its aim as well as lies. The senses then will seek instead for witnesses to what is true. I suppose that that um, paragraph relates to the repurposing that the Holy Spirit does. Mm -hmm. It does answer some of that, doesn't it? Would you like me to read paragraph three? I'll scroll up a bit. There you go. Sin is the home of all illusions, which but stand for things imagined, issuing from thoughts that are untrue. They are the proof that what has no reality is real. Sin proves God's son is evil. Timelessness must have an end. Eternal life must die. And God himself has lost the son he loves. With but corruption to complete himself, his will for forever overcome by death. Love slain by hate and peace to be no more. A madman's dreams are frightening. And sin appears indeed to terrify. And yet what sin perceives is but a childish game. The son of God may play. He has become a body to pray to evil and to guilt. But with a little life that ends in death. With but a little life that ends in death. But all the while his father shines on him and loves him with an everlasting love. Which his pretenses cannot change at all. I, I try to think of this world as, as a fantasy. Uh, our, our spirit lives in God and we just are fantasizing this whole entire universe and, and like a TV show or something. Like, yeah, like a computer game. I often think of it as a computer yeah. game. <laughs> And we seem to have so many choices and, and they, each of those choices lead us further down into the game, further down into rabbit holes, new rabbit holes, 
Nine lives, 99 <laughs> lives. You know, I wonder uh, about science. I, I, I love the studying science. Uh, not that I'm a, a great at it, but uh, it's always interested me. Uh, astronomy and, and also that sort of thing. But I, I worry that possibly the, the, the more we look at the world and the more we analyze it, are we creating more complexity by doing that and, and sort of going away from our goal? I mean, science is wonderful for medical reasons and, and things like that. And it's very interesting, but we, we could be making the world more complex by studying it that closely. So we have to stay on focus with the course. <laughs> Keith? <laughs> I would ask, who would complexity serve? It, can, it serves egos, apparently. Yeah, only the ego, I think. Because it's. I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say it's really simple. It's not complex at all. None of this is. We make it complex because we don't want. I I think. It's being made complex by us so that we don't have to. Really accept the fact that the way out of it is to forgive everybody everybody forgive the whole world for everything and if we could really do that we would be home free <laughs> you mean including science yeah well i think we i think we you know we are god stuff so of course we created i believe we created this world and so we created really interesting stuff that's like proof that this is real and it looks real. Boy, that new telescope they have looking further and further back. My husband is really interested in all that. And so he talks about that a lot. And, and I just think, yeah, yeah, we were really good. We were really good at creating all of this. And nobody even knows. We don't even know what all we created, you know? But I'm not surprised that it is so magnificent out there, you know? doesn't make it real. <laughs> it raised a question in my mind, though. Did we create all this complexity before we inhabited the universe I, and, and became humans? Or oh, I, I are, think are we making it more complex as we go along? All of that. I think all of that. All right, Ardis' hand is up for a long, has been up for a long time, Ardis. Well, actually, it it really doesn't make a bit of difference whether this is complex or simple, because it's not about form anyway. It's about right. content, and the whole thing is is that sure you can look through the telescopes and we can all these wonderful scientific things and whatnot, but the thing is it really doesn't have any substance to it whatsoever. The only thing that's real is that which is eternal. And none of this, all the greatest scientists and all the greatest discoveries, none of this is real. And so earlier was asked, well, what is it going to feel like when we don't have these senses and we don't? Well, it's impossible really to know just now. All we can know is that it's absolutely different from what we know now. And if we want to toy around with science or anything else, that's fine, because we're going to be, our home is, it's already decided. We're already there. So it doesn't really matter. We can make it as short or as long as we appear to have it be. But um, it's, it's, nice, it's nice to kind of look around and enjoy what's here and all, as long as we keep it in, in perspective that what Sharon said is absolutely true. It's all about forgiveness. It does anything else doesn't really make any difference, and that takes all these pages of this book to get it to us. But um, it's worthwhile. It's a worthwhile walk on the journey without distance to the goal. It's never changed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, Keith, and then Peter. And and to Andrew, um, you know, Ken Ken Watt makes said something to the effect of. 
the course is not about what you do or don't do. It's just that you don't take it serious. So mm-hmm. enjoying science, studying yeah. science, you know, no big deal. Just don't make it serious. Yeah. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> and Peter? Uh, the only thing I would add to this whole conversation is I find it very curious that science is now telling us, is showing us the illusory nature, nature of reality, you know, the, mm-hmm. the quantum quantum effect, yeah. you know, the observer effect in quantum physics, which says, you, you know, whatever we observe, we affect, we have an effect on, you know, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, string theory, and it, it's all pointing to the illusory nature of what we think of as reality. Yeah. Which is, uh, yeah. of course, and, and a lot of other esoteric te- uh, teachings have been telling us for centuries that it's all illusion. And I, I like science, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. If, 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 if I may add to it, um, what comes to mind is, Somewhere in the course, it says anything that we look on with love is real because love mm. makes it makes it so. And so mm. if if a scientist is devoted and to, to his research and, and to his colleagues and to the project with love, with true love, the love in it is real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's another of these things that the ego made that the Holy Spirit can repurpose. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if it's yeah. if it's it's a knife in the kitchen or it's the it's the cutting cutting edge uh, science. They're they're the same mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. And and as long as we're here, we have to offer up something as kindle for the fire. <laughs> <laughs> Good way to put it. <clears throat> Great question, Andrew. Um, I'll share again. Because the last paragraph, uh, Keith, would you read the last paragraph of, uh, of that essay? Sure will. How long, O Son of God, will you maintain the game of sin? Shall we not put away these sharp-edged children's toys? How soon will you be ready to come home? Perhaps today? There is no sin. Creation is unchanged. Would you still hold return to heaven back? How long? Oh, holy son of God, how long? Yeah, Jesus sounds a bit exasperated with us. (laughs) Okay. We still have time for one more lesson. Shall we continue here? All right. Um. Ardith, would you read, please? It's 251. Uh, which one? 251. 251. Okay, I have to pull it up on my thing here. Let's see. Um, I had it just a minute ago. Oh, here it is. I am in need of nothing but the truth. I sought for many things and found despair. Now do I seek but one. For in that one is all I need and only what I need. All that I sought before... I needed not and did not even want. My only need I did not recognize. But now I see that I need only truth. In that, all needs are satisfied, all cravings end, all hopes are finally fulfilled, and dreams are gone. Now have I everything that I could need. Now have I everything that I could want. And now at last, I find myself at peace. For that peace, our Father, we give thanks. What we denied ourselves, you have restored, and only that is what we really want. Thank you. Yeah. That reminds me of what Peter was saying about, about the will. Yes. And about really being really happy. Yes, yes, definitely. It reminds me a little bit of uh, a prayer that Jesus has in the Course. Uh, Only the truth is true. Nothing else matters. Nothing else is real. And everything beside it is not there. Let me make the one distinction for you that you 
cannot make but need to learn. Your faith in nothing is deceiving you. Offer your faith to me and I will place it in the holy place where it belongs. You will find no deception there, only the simple truth and you will love it because you will understand it. That is really nice, Andrew. Do you know by heart where that is to be found? No, it's. I, I think it's fairly early in the text. Mm. Maybe Are you reciting that by memory, Andrew? Yes, I am. That's, That's wonderful. Could wonderful. you repeat the first line? The yeah. First, no. the first. Only the truth is true. Only the truth. Yeah. Oh, that's so familiar. <laughs> it rings yeah. familiar. Are you, are you looking are it you, up, Arden? Are you? Yeah, I was going to see if I can it? find okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. If I do. I will definitely tell you what it says here. Let's see. Um. Hmm. Well, there's five results here. I'm not sure which one it is. Oh, here it must be this one. I don't know. They all say the same thing. So I would I would say go ahead and, and uh, search for it yourself in that search. It does say in Chapter 6, for sure, um, if the center of the thought system is true, only truth extends from it. And then it says, for instance, in Lesson 66, let us try today to realize only the truth is true. And it probably goes on from there. And there are three more references to it. But I would say go ahead and, and put that only the truth is true in your search engine, and you'll get those five results. Mm, okay. And the, it was in a telesized prayer that's in, in with the text in one ah. of the chapters. I can't remember. It is the yeah. text. You were, you're pretty sure. Yes. Because definitely. that, that definitely, okay, then that definitely narrows it down to this one. Let me see if I can, um, I don't want to take up too much time here. It's quite no, long, I'll, actually. I'll put, I'll put it in the, in the share screen. I was typing it along with you. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. But all right, we'll, we'll leave it at that then. But it's a lovely prayer. I'm going to look it, it up is. afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, we've almost come to the top of the hour. And I would like to end with a closing prayer from uh, chapter 23, the sixth, the sixth paragraph in the introduction. And lesson 189. I've, I've glued them together. And you can read along if you want to. Because it's uh, in share screen. Nothing around you, but is part of you. Look, including science, Andrew, <laughs> look on it lovingly and see the light of heaven in it. So will you come to understand all that is given you. In kind forgiveness will the world sparkle and shine and everything you once thought sinful now will be reinterpreted as part of heaven. How beautiful it is to walk clean and redeemed and happy through a world in bitter need of the redemption that your innocence bestows upon it. What can you value more than this? For here is your salvation and your freedom. And it must be complete if you would recognize it. Father, we have called and you have answered us. We will not interfere. Salvation's ways are not our own, for they belong to you. Our hands are open to receive your gifts. We have no thoughts we think apart from you and cherish no beliefs of what we are or who created us. Yours is the way that we would find and follow. And we ask but that your will, which is our own as well, be done in us and in the world that it become a part of heaven now. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining, for being here, Thank you. for contributing, Thank you. Thank and for you. your presence. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Much Thank appreciated. You. Bye.